we'll kind of start doing the little intro bit. My name's Ian Cooper. Uh, and what I'm going to try and endeavor to talk to you about today is that one of the problems I tend to see quite a bit out there for folks uh, doing, say, messaging, who want to, want to do event-driven architectures, is they struggle with this idea of when do I send and receive a message? Because at that point, I become asynchronous and, hey, I really want some kind of synchronous response here, surely, to my request. And can I really wait and latency, right? And you know, even, even where I work currently, uh, I see a lot of teams going, oh, yeah, but the latency of making a call. And, um, and a lot of it is about how we think about work, right? And, uh, and how we've modeled what the divisions of that responsibility will be. And what I'm going to do today is look at some older ideas uh, that will give us a different and perhaps better perspective on how we should divide the work up to support being asynchronous. It should be a nice, gentle, straightforward post-lunch session. Uh, anyone of you who feels like it can snooze in the back, that's fine. Um, uh, but there shouldn't be anything too hard here. Who am I? This just says that I'm old. It, it also says that I encourage you not to believe that people standing here are somehow elevated above you. We are all just people. I have been doing this a while. I have some things to share. You all have things to share, whether you know it or not, with people around you. There are people that don't know what you know, and I'd encourage you all to think about um, having a go at speaking. It's very scary at first, but it does get better. If there are any .NET devs in the room, I work on an open source project called Brighter. We do messaging for .NET platforms. Um, please check us out if you're interested. Uh, I'm going to talk about three things. So first, for anyone who was in my session yesterday, apologies, we're going to do a brief slot, two slides that were there yesterday. We're just going to say what, what I mean by synchronous and asynchronous conversation. And then we're going to go and look back in the past at the world of paper workflows. I am old enough to have worked in a, what we call a pre-automation office with paper workflows. And I'll explain to you how they can effectively help us reason about asynchronous uh, flowing systems, because it turns out paper-based pre-automation offices were mostly asynchronous. We're looking at an idea from the 19, late 1970s, nine, early 80s, called flow-based programming, which was, um, there was flow-based programming, there was an object orientation. One of them won, the other one perhaps deserves a little bit of us looking again at some of its ideas. And then I'll talk a little bit practically about how you can try using uh, these insights with approaches like value stream mapping and event storming to understand how to slice up your, your system so that it can support asynchronous work. Okay. So what do I mean by a synchronous conversation? Uh, so in a synchronous conversation, both parties must be present for communication to succeed. So the classic example would be something like a phone call, right? I pick up the phone, I call you. In order for that to be a successful communication, you have to be at the other end and pick up the phone. If you are not there, my conversation with you won't succeed. In an asynchronous conversation, the receiver doesn't need to be present at the time, and the sender communicates with them using a store and forward to pick up the message later. So a mailbox, right? I send you something, it goes in your mailbox, you can be out shopping, you come back, you pick it up, and you, re and you read my, my, uh, my, my, my message to you. That has huge advantages because it means we are not temporarily coupled. We don't have to both be available at the same time in order for communication to succeed. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, nowadays, nearly all the communication I do with people um, tends to be uh, via some sort of messaging, right? WhatsApp, Slack. You know, uh, not by a basic phone call. The only person that phones me is my mum, and she is in her 80s, so she gets an excuse, basically, for phoning me. Um, I can remember, you know, back in the 80s, early 90s, before really things like text were common, trying to organize a night out on Friday with your friends was a nightmare, because it's phoning everybody up, and they're not there, they're at a de desk at a meeting. Now, nah, you just hop on WhatsApp, WhatsApp and send a message, right? So for exactly the same reasons that we all find asynchronous conversations to be much easier, they actually are much easier for our software systems too because they remove this problem of temporal coupling. Thank you. 
So, where can we learn about how we succeed with asynchronous um, workflows? So one place to really look is back in the past when before we had automated offices, things were done with paper. So I currently work for Just Eat Takeaway. Imagine that I decided I was going to create a business in a pre-automation world that wanted a similar business model, which is I am going to deliver you food from a restaurant. Restaurants will sign up with my business, right? I will then ship a catalog to your house. It'll come through the letterbox, a bit of junk mail for you. You, when you, when you want to order some food, you'll look in my paper catalog and you'll go, hmm, I fancy that. You'll phone me up. One of my order takes will take the order. We will fax the order to the restaurant. The restaurant will cook it and then someone will deliver it, right? We can do it all with telephones, fax machines, and pieces of paper, right? And I think well, hopefully what you'll see is a bit of insight into how we used to do asynchronous processes. Now, this is a, I'll show you how to build these later on. This is a value, it's a value stream map. What it's showing you is a particular flow. This is basically probably what we'd call an environmental flow. It supports our business. And this is onboarding a new restaurant to our business. So a restaurant saying, I want to be part of just paper takeaways business. I want to be in the catalog. And so what would happen initially, the first process we look at is essentially somebody's going to phone our sales team. And our sales team are essentially going to say, OK, here's how you sign up. Here's how much it costs. Here's what we take from the order. Come to a deal with the restaurant. These things refer to lead time, how long it takes before the queue is, processing time, how long effectively it takes to actually deal with one of these items, how many of them succeed. Goes to our team that manage menus, right? They're going to take the menu details from you, and they're going to put the menu details into basically our catalog, and we're going to publish that, and it will go out basically to all the customers. Right? So how do we used to do that? Okay. A couple of things you need to know. On the left, this is a typical pre-automation desk. We have the outbox and the inbox, and they are what they say on the tin, right? The inbox is where things you need to action or information to support you actioning things arrive, and the outbox is where you put things that you have done. And the idea is work comes into my inbox, I am busy, I process stuff at my desk, and when I'm done it, I pass it to the outbox. And a key concept here is the bit of the time when I'm effectively trying to be synchronous is essentially when I'm actively working on an item. Right? I might make a phone call, or something like that, effectively in order to clarify something. And when it goes to the outbox, I am then asynchronous. The inbox, right? Outbox, the inbox is asynchronous. So what happens is someone comes by with a mail cart. Let's call him Franz Kafka. So Kafka delivers messages between inboxes and outboxes, right? What gets sent? Well, I'll use a couple of these things. So on the left-hand side, we can think of these as our events, right? So generally, you'd send one of these little envelopes, and you'd put on the name. Routing information would go on the front. you say, who's it for? And inside, usually a memo or a, or a small or a short letter, which basically says, please, can you do this? It's a request for some kind of immediate action or a notification saying, just be aware that X has happened, all right? So you can think about these as skinny messages, and they're discreet and often immediately actioned. The other thing that flows around the building are files. And files represent the information that you may need to carry out one of these actions. Customer details, history, um, uh, all sorts of information, and big fat things. So we can think about those as doc what we call document or fat messages. They're often not immediately action, they often support action, right? And they're often basically what we call series rather than discrete. You get a whole set of them. Final thing you might want to know, it's less important to our example, but just because I had to work, my first sort of job before university, um, I, I, got, I worked in one of these mail rooms doing this. This is what they call the frame. And what happens is, you can think of it as our broker, Franz Kafka comes with his cart, and we basically take all the stuff out. We sort it into basically uh, pigeonholes for floors, and then basically someone takes the delivery into that floor and takes the message across. So this is a primitive broker, right? It's routing things to their destination. Oh, yeah, one more thing, those of you who haven't seen it. I assume everyone, you guys have all seen fax machines, right? They still exist enough for, for the youngsters in the audience. But that's, I can send paper between two places, right? Excellent. So this is typically how it might work. I'm a restaurant owner. 
and I want to join this amazing new business, Just Paper Takeaway. I think this is really, really going to increase the orders to my restaurants. So I get my phone and I make a synchronous conversation. And it goes to the sales team at Just Paper Takeaway. And they take down my details and they say, fantastic, we'll sign you up. I'll get one of our menu people to phone you and take details of your menu. And what I do as the salesperson is I probably open a file saying, hey, I've got this ongoing sales process. And I put basically a request, one of the discrete for action items in my outbox saying, hey, menu team, please can you contact this customer and get their menu details. Kafka comes along and he collects stuff and puts it in his mail cart and he delivers it over to the team that deal with menus. Team would do with menus, take it out of their inbox, and they probably open a file too, saying, okay, I've got a menu request that I need to deal with. Because it's going to take some time, and I'm going to need to basically correlate the responses when they come in. I then fax the restaurant, right? I fax the restaurant saying, please can you fill out basically your menu for our catalog? Over at the restaurant, someone takes the fax, and they may well open a file too, saying, oh, another one of these menu requests from these newfangled um, paper-based uh, uh, delivery companies. Um, I will effectively put a request in the, chef's, in the inbox for the chef, and the chef can create a menu, basically, for this company. So it goes over to the chef's desk. It goes to his inbox from your outbox by um, uh, probably uh, Franz Kafka's cousin, uh, who works in the restaurant. And, and Kafka effectively takes it to the chef, and the chef then basically fills out the menu and puts it in his outbox. Okay. From the outbox, Franz takes it basically to the team that confirmed the request. They essentially say, right, we're done. Take it off in their file and say that particular action is done, and they fax it back to us. We then pick it up over basically in the process menu request team, and they say, okay, where's the file for that one? Okay, so I'm going to be done that piece of work. Okay, that's complete, and I can put something in the outbox with the details, probably put the whole file in for the team that actually builds menus. Team that builds menus effectively gets it in their inbox, and they go away, and they do some reprographics work, and they update the basic new catalog, which is dispatched to all our happy, lovely customers. Right? And you can see the only real synchronous part of that flow is when the call is made to us, basically, to request that we put you in the menu. Everything else is a flow from inboxes to outboxes with some busy work in the middle, such as effectively completing menu details. Right? But what we're doing is we're moving between these process steps. And these flows are naturally asynchronous. We can have pauses to wait for stuff to come back. Um, and somebody, anyone heard the messaging term routing slip? Something might have. Yeah, so this is actually a routing slip. This is what they actually look like. Um, so you can see it's basically like a workflow and has a list of people. Uh, or it means that person retains it at the end and it's saying either there's information for you, in other words, I want you to know that this is happening, or action. You have an action to take and basically what happens is you just go through each person in the list and they do what they're supposed to do. And we use that messaging all the time, the idea effectively that a message could contain the workflow um, that it should be following. Okay, so I've sent out my menu. Someone basically now wants to place an order with our fabulous business, okay? So the customer wants to order food. So there's an order food process where they find out one of our lovely agents. They could, I could make even this asynchronous and assume businesses will fax it in, right? But for the minute we're assuming domestic customers don't have a fax machine and they're gonna phone us up. Um, they'll take the order, they'll pass over to the payments team. In fact, we only have a certain number of people who can take credit cards. Right, they'll take the order. Um, once the order is paid for, um, it will go to our order placement team who will then put it out to a given restaurant. And once the restaurant confirms that they're gonna, they're gonna fulfill the order, our customer agents will phone back the customer and, or text them and say, your order's on its way. Okay. So how does that work? Well, the customer has a catalog. Right. We sent them one. Asynchronously, they have received instructions which let them place an order with us. Anyone who isn't familiar with it should probably read a white paper by Pat Helen called Data on the Outside versus Data on the Inside. And Pat talks about an idea he calls reference data. So reference data is data that we need to publish to other services in order to help them make requests. Okay. Um, and commonly when we do it by messaging, the term we tend to use nowadays is event carriage state transfer which means I use messaging to let you build up uh, the data you will need to send me your request. Right. 
So that just the equi- we do exactly the equivalent of this. I give you a catalog so you can make an order. And the same thing is true you know, for UIs, right? My, ser- my microservice publishes data that you can then use in a UI effectively to make requests. Okay. And they place the order, and they phone up my team to place the order. My team also has the catalog. Why? Well, when the customer phones up, I need to validate the order, right? I need to basically go through, validate that's the correct order for that restaurant, figure out what the price is, say to the customer, hey, that's going to be, you know, 24 pounds, etc. Note that we may have issues with eventual consistency. What do we mean by that? Well, typically what happens is some of our customers, they put this in their drawer, they get a new one, and they're kind of like, we've already got one of those, and throw it away. And so they're ordering from an out-of-date set of data, right? So what happens is we have to resolve those eventual consistency issues, which tends to be that our team has actually the correct copy of the lookup data that they need, and they will simply tell the customer, I'm afraid you can't order that item, or no, actually it's now going to be 27 pounds rather than 24 because the prices have gone up. Is that okay? We resolve those issues all the time in normal workflows in, in the kind of business. Now, they probably use the phone system to put you on hold, transfer you to somebody who can take a payment. They will basically use our card machine, which has a basic, an option for cardholder not present. We'll put through the card machine effectively, and if we take the payment successfully from you, then the take payment team can basically put an order in their outbox saying there's a priced and validated order from a customer. Okay. And again, there's a synchronous flow which occurs basically from the customer to the order taker. You can think of that as someone filling out basically information on a website. But at that point, effectively, the synchronous flow continues, although we kind of do a, a, a little bit of a kind of sync over, async over sync, right? We, let, we don't have to, we allow the order taker to take new orders while effectively um, we transfer to the other payment person. And then essentially at that point, we uh, raise an order. So if we go into restaurants, this is basically actually still in the, how restaurants tend to do this today. This is called the order wheel. So they, you can think of it as a message queue. What happens is I get a piece of paper on the waitress with somebody's order. And I go and stick it basically on the next available um, slot on the order wheel. The chef comes along, rotates it round clockwise, takes the next item in turn, and basically fulfills that order. Right? So people all the time use things like messaging, message queues, asynchronous flows, right? In the real world, all the time, that's what we do. Okay. So I have a processed and validated order, and that arrives in my order placement team. It goes into their inbox. It's basically just a order request, so it will be a simple, uh, inside a simple envelope. There's no file required. And essentially, they say, okay, I need to look up basically some details I've got about the restaurant. We don't really show that here, but somewhere they've probably got a book that gives the restaurant's fax numbers. They get the fax number for the restaurant, and they fax the order over to the restaurant. The order-taking team at the restaurant basically effectively uh, will essentially take it off the fax machine. They probably essentially put that in an actionable envelope, and they stick it in their outbox for Franz Kafka's cousin to pick up and go and effectively take towards the chef. The chef decides whether or not they can fulfill the order. We've got the ingredients, we're too busy, et cetera. But assuming they choose to accept the order, then essentially he will effectively send the order request over to the delivery desk. The delivery desk is probably um, me phoning my cousin Bob uh, to decide whether or not essentially Bob's car is working and he can actually deliver the order for us. If, if so, what Bob will tend to do is basically say, that's fine, I can probably deliver to the customer at 7.15. And he sends a message back from his outbox. He puts two messages in the outbox. One will say, um, hey, I'm going to deliver the order at 7.30 to the chef so the chef knows I better start cooking that at 10 past 7. And the other one goes back basically to the order taking team uh, to say, can you fax back to just paper takeaway to tell them the order's been accepted? We then get a fax back, right? And again, we must have usually effectively at some point, we've got a file, we get that or- the, the, the request back and we say, look up that order in the file and we say, okay, that order's now completed. And we can effectively raise something to say, okay, we now have basically an accepted order at the restaurant. And again, this flow is asynchronous, right? 
I get in something to my inbox asynchronously. I put it over a fax machine. The other team get it in the, by their fax machine, put it in their outbox. It goes to the chef, into his inbox. He actions it, puts it in his outbox. It goes to the driver booking. They action it and say effectively, okay, I've got to, they, they raise two messages, one to the chef, one back to us, and that asynchronous flow comes across, and we pick up our file that says, hey, um, uh, that order's now complete, and raise an order completed message from our outbox. And that then flows to our customer, our customer agents. A customer agent receives that in their inbox, and they have basically a request, that, a, a thing saying, this order has been basically successfully placed with a restaurant, and it's, they say they're going to deliver at 7.30, and I then phone up the customer and say, your food is coming at 7.30. And that would be a synchronous conversation at this point, unless we decide, you know, we're living in a world where SMS exists, in which case I, I, you know, I, I text you or whatever, right? But again, that's another synchronous part of the flow potentially, all right? And you can see overall that there are two things that are happening. One we can think of as flow, right? It's this asynchronous conversation. There are information packets moving between desks where people are taking actions and hustling when effectively somebody is actually doing some work. They take a thing out of the inbox and they, and they do whatever their particular function is, right? Work on whatever we've got and then they potentially raise some new message to their outbox. And that is really the model, right? That is the model of effectively how we build s software that we want to work in an asynchronous fashion. We still need to think about individual processing desks where a particular part, a particular business process is carried out and think about a flow of kind of inbox to outbox that says, you do your step, okay, there's a, okay, we'll hand it off, next person does their step, we'll hand it off, next person does their step. So you can see we have, although we have a synchronous flow there, you probably can't see the colors on the screen, um, this onboarding of a restaurant is effectively all asynchronous at that point, right? Don't worry about the detail. Um, and then we basically produce that catalog. It goes basically to our order taking team to the customer. It's asynchronous, it's just going via snail mail, right? And then essentially there is this synchronous call from the customer, which then effectively we take their order. And then essentially it's an asynchronous flow, placing it with the restaurant, the restaurant booking its driver, confirming the order and us then basically responding with a synchronous call at the end. But the thing I want you to take away from this is not the detail in this diagram, but an understanding that when we built paper-based systems, we just consistently worked in a mostly asynchronous fashion. That is the norm. That's what we've done for hundreds of years. Synchronous internal models of your system are actually the abnormality. What about errors? What about errors in asynchronous systems? This is, by the way, uh, in case some of you have never seen it, um, you, when, you're, when you send a fax, you get a fax receipt, and the fax receipt has a code, right, on the end, and it tells you basically whether your fax was sent or not, right? Okay. So what would happen, for example, if uh, my uh, order-taking team I've got an order, they've got, they've got a request in their inbox, they've opened up a file, um, and they send the order over to the restaurant, right? And they get a uh, receipt back off the fax machine, and that says there's an error. What happens? Well, generally, what happens normally? We just retry, right? <laughs> just say, let's try sending that fax again. I've got a copy on file, probably. All right, and I resend the copy that I got on file. So, copies on file. So the model we used to use was this, right? Basically carbon paper. So I write on the top sheet and it presses on the bottom sheet below, which is carbon paper. It takes an impression of it and I then have a copy of the message that I intended to send. If the message gets lost, then essentially I, I have a carbon copy I can send. All right. So imagine that you are phoning up just paper takeaway and you want to be onboarded and the sales team and you agree the contract and the sales team puts a message into their outbox for Franz Kafka to deliver um, to our team to take menu. And it turns out uh, what you want to do is create a file saying here's my uh, sales account for this customer, right? And I put a copy, a carbon copy of the message I intend to send to the team that processed the menu request on my file. 
And if for some reason Franz Kafka's having a bad day and he loses essentially my message, then when effectively the customer tends to phone me up and say, well, I've not been onboarded yet onto your, into your lovely new catalog. I've seen two catalogs go by, my restaurant's not in it. I can take the copy out of my uh, file and resend it to the processing order team. And today you may be aware of terms like outbox or log tailing, and that's what we use in asynchronous systems. What we're doing is we're simply saying, keep a copy of the message that you have sent to everyone downstream such that in the event that there is a failure of that message to be transmitted to the downstream, you can just resend it. Indeed. <laughs> what about declined transactions, right? And they see in this kind of process, what happens if the customer uh, was to be declined? So we'll, we'll modify the process a little bit, right? And we'll assume somehow that the order payment um, uh, I was showing the line to, to a phone, but let's say assuming we want to do the order processing somehow asynchronously. We put a request in with the customer's details and the order team effectively then uh, went away and did a card holder not present without the customer on the phone. We assume, we just say, give us your details, we'll run it through the credit card machine um, uh, and we'll let you know if there's a problem. So what happens in that case is it's just a new flow, right? In the event effectively your transaction is declined, we simply put a message in our outbox, uh, which goes to virtually the inbox of the customer agent saying, customer's card was declined, please can you request to present a new card? And generally speaking, because that happens infrequently, we may decide that's okay. There's a risk we might have better get hold of the customer, but that's fine, he doesn't get any food at that point, right? There's no process to validated order. And because most of our transactions go through without a problem, there's no point in asking the customer to wait on the line. All right, so hopefully that helps you a little bit. Um, I'm just gonna take a quick drink of water. If, uh, if anyone has a question at that point, you can ask, it's fine. You don't have to be quiet. No, we're good. All right, we are software engineers, not paper engineers. So although it's useful to think about it this way, is there any more ad advice which is more practical for software engineers? So flow-based programming was created by Paul Morrison, who worked for IBM in the kind of 70s and 80s. It still has some life, particularly if you go and look at the kind of um, uh, reactive architectures movement. The reactive architectures movement is aware of flow-based programming, and, occasion and I think there are a couple of flow-based programming uh, tools out there. Uh, and it sits along things like um, data flow, et cetera, and similar kind of reactive uh, ideas. Now, what happened was, this is the dominant paradigm that we got. So objects on the right-hand side, effectively, are state and behavior, right? So I capture some state and I put it in an object and I say, any methods that effectively depend upon that state, in other words, behaviors that basically require that state, go on the object, right? And in a good world, we hide the state. Um, unfortunately, due to ORMs, et cetera, we've ended up exposing all our stateless properties, but that's a different talk for a different day. And we use what's called call and returns. What does call and return mean? So call and return says everything starts generally with a, with a, with a method called main. And in main, I call an ob a method on an object. And that method on the object does some work and it calls a method on another object, which calls a method on another object. And eventually, at some point, something in the chain goes, well, I'm going to return, and the flow of control passes back to the thing that we called it, and then back and back and back, and eventually, we hit the return on main, and the program ends, right? So that's why it's called, it's called basically call and return. That is the dominant paradigm that we all use today in nearly every language you're writing. So, so Paul Morrison's alternative is this flow-based programming. So we'll start on the left-hand side. So the key idea is this thing called the information packet, which is an independent structured piece of information with a well-defined lifetime from creation of destruction. And in FBP, the IP contains the state. It flows, they are out there, not in storage. What do we mean by that? The data does not live in an object, uh, right? The data lives in an information packet. It lives quite separately to the code that essentially has the behavior. And we pass these information packets around. The component 
is where behavior happens, right? In FEP, the component contains the behavior. So what happens is an information packet flows into a component via a port, the point where a connection makes uh, contact with a process, right? So in other words, in I go in via a port into my component, the in port, we've known it in says information packets coming in, I do some work on it, and then it flows, a new information packet usually flows out of the out port. Right? And the model in flow-based programming is you say, what are the behaviors, what are the hustles, the pieces of process or busy work that I need to do, right? What information flows into them for them to be able to act and what information flows out of them when they are done? And if you think about it, that's exactly the model we've just been talking about with pre-automation systems. I have an inbox and I have an outbox. I have an import and I have an outport. I have, I have, I have memos and I have files. I have information packets. Right, that are flowing through my system. Okay. So an IP has a lifetime. Once a component has consumed an IP, it deletes it. Components use queues. Right. So I'm distinguishing queue and stream. So a queue, we effectively take a piece of work, we lock it and say, I'm the one basically reading that. Essentially, when we finish with it, we delete it so nobody else processes it. Right. Whereas an event stream is you move a pointer through effectively and other people can process the same message. So queuing semantics, because we want to basically say, I've got this piece of work. When I have consumed this piece of work, I delete it. No one else needs to do that piece of work. It's been actioned. And I raise basically the result of doing that work, an information packet going out. The component has ports. And those ports, what we tend to say in flow-based programming, what you want to do is basically think about a logical abstraction. So PORT is abstracted away from the domain logic. It's a logical address from which things are read or to which things are dispatched. So if you see people uh, doing flow-based programming code, they will simply say it's like something like send to in, or rather read from in, send to out, right? And they'll just use basically an abstraction to represent the port. Your domain code just uses an abstraction. We do the same thing in messaging. We talk about channels. There are virtual pipe which you address. I mean, if you think about topics on Kafka, routing keys on RabbitMQ, they are all effectively names we can give to ports, right? You can have multiple ports and connectors. Um, uh, generally, um, you know, you, you may receive a number of signals and you may pump out a number of signals. Uh, in uh, ports can have multiple uh, types of information packet on the same port because you may want to be sequencing them. I put them in an order, right? So you basically may say, this has to come before this. So you have to read this one first, then you can read this one next. So they have to use the same import, right? And on outports, we only tend to use one thread to write to an individual port, so we can preserve sequencing of things going out of the port as well, right? And that's very similar, actually, to the way some things like event streams work today. Um, we tend to basically only have one thread processing them, and we effectively need to make sure that we have, uh, make sure that we're, a, a thread is only pushing out one item at a time in order. And what happens is we make more complex systems by hooking together components, right? So think Unix pipes and filter style architectures, right? I have a component, it receives an information packet, it does some transformation, it produces more information packets which go to other components, right? And we refer to that in Flowers programming as a network. And then what we can do is we can simplify our reasoning about things by taking a number of uh, components, a, a network, and saying, well, I can think about this as actually a component, right? Um, because it has an in and it has an out, so I can just really avoid the detail and just reason about this larger macro idea of things, something that goes in and out, so there's a subnet, right? And so subnets are collections of components that kind of fulfill a purpose, and we'll see that in a second, well, how, how we use that. Okay. So let's go through that same just paper takeaway flow again, but this time, let's think of it in the terms of flow-based programming. So start up the left-hand side. This dotted line basically is going to indicate a subnet in which we have three components, by the way, right? Uh, we have a qualified restaurant, request it doesn't make catalog. So that's our sales process. 
that's our team basically requesting details from the restaurant. The menu, that's basically our upper graphics department making the catalog, right? We've got ports between them, out and in, out and in. So we just think, we're just trying to capitalize on that inbox, outbox idea for you, right? Work comes into my inbox, comes into my in port, right? Leaves by my outbox, goes out for my out port, right? Now, in FBP, what we do is we treat basically a UI as just a stream of uh, information coming into basically uh, our, our, our subnet. Uh, and then what happens is we go basically through a uh, qualified restaurant. We presume we do some validation of what we've received over the UI. It then comes to request details where we have to fax the restaurant. We're not going to show the restaurant side of the equation just for simplicity. And what happens here is that a component may have state which enables it to correlate between IPs that arrive across time. For example, storing the details request until it gets a fax menu response to then pass it along with details. So that's what we're saying is, I faxed you something, I'm going to need to take a correlation ID on it. You're going to give me a response a bit later. I'm going to be doing other work in the meantime. I'll pick up that correlation ID, and I will essentially say, hey, this is the response to that request. And that also means this kind of component needs storage. And it needs storage because the request needs to need storage to be reliable. It takes work from the import, but cannot send to the output without waiting for the correlated fax input and output, which is asynchronous. What would be dropped if we lost the process without being able to recover where we were? In other words, because I'm waiting, what happens if I crash? Any work in flight would be lost if it's just in memory. So I store waiting requests into a database. Right? Interestingly enough, and something I often point out to my colleagues is in this entire subnet, which we could think of potentially as a microservice because it's a business process that we're aligned with, right? In this entire subnet, it's only really this step in the middle that actually requires us to store anything. Everything else could actually rely on the storage provided to us by queues. Now, it's quite a ballsy move, but you may find that actually we could remove quite a lot of databases from our systems because if we've got queues, they're actually acting as a data store for work that's in flight and you only need them for reliability in between it. Okay. So let's go to the order food one, right? Remember, order food, have a customer. The customer basically goes to where we're going to validate and price the order. Once we have a validated and priced, priced order, it'll go to take payment where we'll basically say, hey, bank, can I take the payment for that? We'll take the payment, right? Customer, again, basically has a UI, which is being treated basically as a stream of information packets coming in to take order. Uh, Flow-based programming calls the, I, this idea a lookup. It's the same thing we're talking about. Pat Hunt calls it reference data. We saw it as basically a paper catalog, right? It's how do I validate and price the order? So somewhere off screen is effectively our, our earlier system, which has produced effectively a stream of information packets, which we use to build a table. And then at take order time, I just simply look up in that table and say, hey, is this a valid item at that restaurant? Hey, how much does this cost? Okay, great. I can then price and validate the order using that lookup data. And we do this all the time with things like event carriage state transfer and messaging. Um, internally, actually, at Jesse Take, we call them projections, where effectively we have a cache of data that's come from another system, which we use to do things like validate and price stuff, et cetera. Right. Okay. So I take that lookup data, and then effectively, I'm going to take the payment. Um, the interesting thing to note here is that um, uh, there's a synchronous conversation really here going on with the card reader. I basically effectively put it in the bank replies, right? So uh, essentially we say uh, the synchronous request response conversation with the credit card company, which is outside of our control. The card reader component turns this into an asynchronous conversation for take payment, which can thus be used for retries. It means we can use the connector over storage for reliability. What do you mean by that? But if we take payment and we create a card reader component, which has the synchronous conversation, I can queue requests to the card reader and wait for responses from the card reader when they've been actioned. So if the card reader is a constrained component, in other words, I can only make so many requests at any one given time on the card reader. It doesn't matter. I'm just queuing work. Eventually, it arrives back with a correlation ID, and I know that order's now been paid for. Okay. So uh, the whole subnet looks asynchronous, even though there's a synchronous component, basically, to it, because it comes by in and out. Okay. Then we get into the easy world, order placement, right? I'm just doing a fax machine. We saw that earlier. So effectively, we, again, we need our correlation ID, and again, we'll need some storage. 
And you can see that between subnets, the flow is completely asynchronous, right? I have a catalog which becomes look up data for my service in order to do the work of validating and pricing. I place the order effectively. Um, uh, the order basically does the fax machine and effectively goes over the side. Oh, and I've got credit card interaction, which effectively looks asynchronous from the outside. And even within those subnets, those microservices, if you like, most of the interaction apart from this call to the reader is asynchronous. Okay, does flow-based programming help us with basically the, the error flows we saw earlier? Okay, so this is basically the one where effectively your payment fails. Whoops, a daisy, what did I do there? Oh, it wasn't me, we're okay. okay. So generally, errors are a port. We send out errors in flow-based programming on another port. We just say there's a port for errors. Okay, so here what we're saying is if we have a card error, we can just raise it to an error port to signal that we transformed the request IP, please take payment, into an error IP, no payment was successfully taken. Okay. Interestingly, I've done that. Let me just see if, sorry, just a second, I will get that back to you. There we go. Um, okay. Raise the port. And the errors flow. So here what you can see is that in response to me receiving a signal on the error for that particular payment, I can then basically say, right, well, I will raise a card error. So I will basically raise an information packet on the card error port. And my take order component has an in new card required port, which basically receives messages from that card error information packet. And essentially, I then basically place it on an order error port which on the UI basically effectively would probably use a push notification to the customer saying, card decline, please can you present a new one, right? And we do this all the time in messaging, right? Think of these error ports as we're just saying, hey, you know what, there's an error, I'll just raise a message to, for an error to start an error flow through my system to handle that error rather than the flow effectively for the, for the good request. All right, so how, how, can we, how can we use these ideas to build reliable systems today? So the key, I, I think, I found over time is to make sure that when we model what the components are in our system, microservices if you like, um, uh, that they need to be designed to be these individual processing steps that have kind of an inbox and an outbox and you're doing busy work in the middle. And the problem I see a lot is when people try and split across in the middle of the busy work. So I've got something comes in and I go away and I basically say, oh, my job now is to basically validate that request. And I'm gonna make a call halfway through validating this request to this other service. I like validating price, right? And effectively I say, oh, I'm gonna do this work. And then I'm gonna make a call halfway through uh, to a synchronous, uh, this other system over here uh, and then get the response back, but that seems to be synchronous because this all seems like one transaction. So we have examples like, you know, um, I want to give you a price uh, and it includes delivery and it includes um, offers and actually that really is a transaction and the more I split that, the harder it is for me to do work, right? And the problem is when you tend to build systems where you are splitting the busy work in the middle rather than thinking about where is the outbox moment? Where is the moment when I've done my work and handed it over? If I am in processing, I will generally tend to be doing one of two things. Look up to uh, data that I've received asynchronously and having some catalog form to help me do my work, or making a synchronous request because I have to talk to the bank to validate your, your payment details, et cetera. There is no way around that synchronous problem at that point, right? So let me show you a couple of techniques that you may all be already be aware of and how you'd use them as models. So value stream mapping is very useful because value stream mapping is designed to really work in an asynchronous um, uh, fashion. So I'm not, it's not a session about value stream mapping, but I will give you a little bit of an idea of how it works. Um, so the first thing you do basically is you decide what am I going to model? And generally it's one of two things. It's either a journey for a customer uh, saying I want to buy some food or it's what we, which is called basically uh, operational, or it's an environmental 
which basically says something that I need to do to support my ability to service customers. Um, so, for example, probably many of you are staying at a hotel, so maybe like if you're staying at a hotel, check in at your uh, effectively hotel is essentially a, a process, right? But there are operational things to support the check-in flow, which ends actually when you check out, like um, figure out how much money Ian has spent in the minibar, right? You know, Ian got drunk and he ate the Toblerone bar, that needs to go on his bill. Okay. So, kick off, we decide what are we going to model? Then what you do is effectively you walk the process. And in fact, when value stream mapping has, they have this idea called go to the gamble, which is basically walk the actual floor of the process physically. But you quite, we, we, we quite often can't do that in software. But the idea effectively is you walk through. And what you want to do is look for what we call the handovers. So you want to look for the point at which somebody says, I do this to this piece of inf this information packet comes in, essentially this bit of data comes in, I process it in some way, and then there's a result which is this, right? Those are handovers, and those are actually the points where a synchronicity is likely to be possible, right? And you divide up your value stream probably in somewhere of the order of five to 15 steps that have handovers. Okay. And then essentially you just get a whiteboard, a big glass wall, effectively you get post-it notes and you use the post, put the post-it notes in a line and use them to represent the individual steps in the process. And that gives you effectively the flow. Here are the individual steps, here are the individual handoffs. So here you can see we're looking at uh, the sales inquiry for the for restaurant owner. Restaurant owner effectively says, okay, we think there's an onboarding inquiry we think the onboarding inquiry results basically in a handover of, we need to basically get this restaurant signed up. That goes to our team that basically manage the menu and they will hand off when they've got the menu details to the team that publishes the catalog, right? So that gives us a flow. We then do a second walk and the second walk tends to start at the other end and go backwards to say, how do we get here? So in our case, a second walk would be, we have a catalog that has the details of our restaurants in it. How did we get the details of the restaurants in? Oh, okay, well, we have to have a prior step where essentially um, the, the, the catalog was produced. Well, how did they get the menu details? Well, there's a prior step where they asked the restaurant. Okay, how do we know to ask the restaurant? Oh, there's a prior step where a salesman sold them basically the idea of working for just paper, paper takeaway. And then generally in value stream mapping, you add details like lead time, process time, percentage of completions, and you get one of these. And I find value stream mapping is a really uh, quite useful way of doing it because um, forcing people to think about these handovers gives you these individual process steps, which then tend to be useful to think about, hey, these things may well have asynchronous handoffs between them. So event storming is kind of the poster child in this area from Alberto Brandolini and the DDD folks in the audience probably have met event storming in the past. Again, this is not an event storming teaching session, but we'll run through it and highlight the level details that you can understand and work with it. But one of the problems I often find when I do an event storming session is people start to worry about what we mean by event. Generally, when you do event storming, we tend to have a mixed audience, so some tech people, but also the product people, even the delivery people on the team. An event means a different thing to all of them, right? So devs immediately start thinking about, event, when we say event of something I'm sending to Kafka or to Azure Service Bus or to um, SNS, right? So they start thinking technically. Um, uh, the product team have no idea what you mean by event. That's generally a party they go to. Um, and delivery basically essentially are a bit nonplussed and trying to negotiate between product and tech over the meaning of event, right? And it's very unclear event storming about what is an event? Okay. I tend to think of events, what I tend, tend to get people to do in a mixed audience is say, it's something you are shoving into your outbox, right? You've done some work and you generate, th I say, think about a paper-based flow when we're doing event storming. Rather than thinking about computer systems, because they all think about existing systems they have, I say when you're thinking about event storming, let's imagine we're modeling this as bits of paper, right, paper-based flow. And that tends, I find, to make it much easier for them. And you say, what is the thing that I'm sticking into my outbox, right? So what is this information packet in flow-based programming terms? What is the data 
that I am, I, I get as a result of a transformation. Events tends to be a bit too technical as a term. So with event storming, our goal is to essentially look at everything through the lens of events. Okay. So once your events are identified, the gaps between events represent processes that must transform one event into another, or aggregates. Um, I'll talk about aggregates and processes in a second. Uh, and commands initiate flows. In other words, basically something has to kick this off. So basically it has to be an initial theme which says, hey, I'm going to tell you to transform basically this information packet into another one. Okay. So traditionally, this is kind of the model you would use. You have an event, one, one color post-it note, you have an aggregate. An aggregate basically is um, some state and behavior uh, view, basically, which is essentially uh, uh, allows a customer to make decisions by effectively having a lookup data. So think of that as our catalog data uh, and commands which initiate flow. Now, when I tend to do event storming, one of the things I've switched away from is using aggregates to just using an idea of a process. Why? Because when you look at this idea, the problem is that thinking about aggregates, thinking about state it doesn't actually help us think, think really about asynchronicity between systems, and you quite often end up with people modeling um, uh, entity, entity services. I tend to say to people, just think about a process. It's amorphous, it's some kind of thing, some kind of behavior that is transforming commands into events, right, or events into other events. And that tends to, I find, be much easier. I think aggregate is a bit of a, um, it's a DDDism that doesn't actually help very much. Okay. And so uh, here, the things that go in outboxes, well, there's this idea a restaurant has signed up, uh, which is essentially saying I want to get details. There's this idea basically effectively that I have some menu details that I've received from the restaurant. And there's this idea that I've got this new restaurant catalog. Those would seem to be the key um, outbox elements that get raised. Then effectively, I just need to figure out there's a process that transforms these things. There's one that manages catalog, one that obtains restaurant details, and one that agrees the contract, which results in those, which is all kicked off by this command, add my restaurant. And I find this is a much easier way of doing event storming um, because it gets the same result, but I think it's a bit clearer for the, the non-techies in the audience, uh, and particularly the non-DDD people in the audience. So again, here's another model, restaurant catalog updated, order taken, order raised. We can simply transform that like this with the green restaurant catalog representing where we're doing lookup data. So it's a read-only copy of our data, which we can use effectively to do lookups with. Similarly, placing an order, and similarly, order confirmation. There's another technique to be aware of uh, called event modeling by Adam Dimitrik. It's very similar to event storming, but it's much more detailed. Um, and what it focuses on is it says, I want to actually know what is the data in those information packets. Because if I know what the information is in the information packet, I can tell you, did the custom enter that? Did I have to get it from another service? And it lets you effectively trace data requirements. It's expensive because it takes a long time to do, but it can be useful if you're struggling a bit. Okay. So what does that mean in a kind of world of microservices? How does this perspective change how we might think about it? So I'd argue that essentially too many people are still building things which are effectively web services era services. And what they do is essentially they say, I've got a service which is modeled in an OO fashion. It has state and it has behavior applied to that state all in the one service. And you call me to effectively um, uh, apply transformations to my state. And the problem we tend to get is twofold. One is they tend to work better synchronously. And two, the, the key workflow logic tends to move out basically of here to some orchestrating component. And I would say what we need to think about much more as services that look like this in the microservices area, where effectively we see the service as a process that's doing transformation on information packets that are flowing through our system, right? And we should distinguish our universe between 
these things that flow, which effectively are actually really in the sense the heart of our program and these bits of hustling we have to do to do that transformation. And that will help you build asynchronous systems. All right. I think I'm done. I actually have about five minutes for questions, which is a bit unusual. Or you can all be so tired and lunch, lunch uh, uh, sleepy that you want to go away. Does anyone have a question they want to ask? Oh, there's a question. Okay. Tell me the question. I'm, I'll repeat it for the, for the mic. For the... So UI-based tools will flow-based program programs. There are some, there's, there's, there's some, there are some flow-based programming uh, things out there. I can't remember what, there's a JavaScript one that's quite um, famous. Uh, the flow-based programming community thinks they're not quite flow-based programming. They're a little bit different. And they tend to be associated quite a lot with the, with the low-code movement. Um, I am, I think it's interesting. Uh, my reach into flow-based programming is far more looking at the reactive architecture kind of style ideas behind that of saying we ought to focus really on the separation of state and behavior when we think about modeling architecture at a bigger level. Um, and I'm less, con less worried about um, modern attempts to use flow-based programming to produce um, a co an execu coding execution environment in the, in the small inside the service. Um, but they are interesting. Um, but yeah, I think the flow-based programming community has some recent comments up about why they don't, why they think they're uh, they're not quite actually flow-based programming, even though they came to, they claim to be. Got a question? Is it fair to say that the Saga pattern is kind of a modern manifestation? Okay, that's a really good question. Saga pattern. All right. So Saga, Saga for those that, that, that don't really know, uh, so the idea was that um, people realized that you can't do transactions that span multiple um, microservices very easily because there's no distributed transaction coordinator, doesn't scale very well. So the idea was really to produce a state machine which would say, I understand the workflow and what I can do is control each of the steps in the workflow by saying, do this, then do this, then do this and control error flows. That's what we tend to call basically orchestration because there's basically a conductor. The other one is what we call choreography. And choreography says we don't actually need a conductor. We can just essentially pre-arrange all the flows by just simply connecting inboxes to outboxes and having error flows and simply knowing the whole thing goes through. I tend to prefer choreography to orchestration because the trouble with orchestration is it creates this bottleneck single point of failure that contains all my workflows. But in some cases, it can be useful to do that kind of orchestration, such as when I need to think about the reservation pan where I want, I've got, you've got 10 minutes to fulfill this and that kind of thing, et cetera, right? But I tend to prefer choreography, where effectively we say, hey, I can just follow the roots of, in, of, of, of uh, connections between in and out or error flows and that will give me basically my pattern of flow around the whole system. I don't need an external manager of my pipeline. It's the same problem we have in pipeline architectures, right? Pipes and architectures have this, have this conflict between, does someone control the flow through the pipeline or is it just basically flowing from component to component? And I tend to prefer the latter because it doesn't require an orchestrator, but both are useful techniques. Anybody else? All right then, I think we're probably done. Thank you very much for coming and listening and uh, after, I hope it wasn't too threatening after lunch. Do you have something you want to say? Okay. <laughs>